All right. All right, everybody. We got some people uh, still coming in. Welcome. Uh, this has been a little bit of a, a ways in coming. I'm David Kinder, and I have uh, with us today Michael Malloy. And I met Michael through a mutual friend and mentor. Uh, so I want to give a, a quick shout out to Professor Craig Hampton for introducing us. Uh, we met a couple of months ago in a private study group uh, session, got a chance to meet and talk, and it was actually Professor's idea that we hold this session so that we can actually have a session about offshore private placement life insurance. And I have Michael Malloy's books, and again, um, as I've told him, I haven't had a chance to read them, but I have flipped through them, um, so they're, they're well illustrated. Um, but let, let me give a formal introduction here. Michael Malloy is the founding partner of EWP Financial, that's Extended Worldwide Planning Financial. Began his career over 40 years ago as a risk management consultant. He has published in the Life Insurance Law Newsletter, has written two books on private placement life insurance, which is PPLI, the PPLI Papers, and the Wit and Wisdom of Professor PPLI. No relation to Professor Hampton. We did discuss that a couple months ago. Um, although the image um, was somewhat familiar uh that you you mentioned on, on the book on the <laughs> the illustration of the bird that's right here um <laughs> Malloy, <laughs> Malloy insurance services uh, oh no excuse me michael has managed several companies Malloy insurance services advanced financial solutions and presently uh, ewp financial i have not yet shared my allowed to share my screen yet so that michael can now share his presentation he has a wonderfully simple presentation yet it's a rather complex topic and so i've got a few questions that we'll answer throughout uh, i think the only main thing is and i want to touch on this real briefly is that we're not going to talk about any company or carrier names and there's a very specific reason for that and if anybody here is a clu you'll, you'll know that if you have a not admitted carrier in the united states um, anytime you mention that carrier name, it could be considered a solicitation. And so we're not going to be touching on any company name specifically. Um, this is all a high level overview. And but we look forward to answering every other question. And I'm looking forward to seeing this again. So, Michael, thank you for uh, being here with us today. Well, thank you for having me. And hopefully we'll have a lively discussion about uh, offshore PPLI. So should I? Uh... Should I uh, put up my yeah. slides here? Yeah, yeah go ahead. Uh, you should be able to. So, let's see. So, do you, what do you see? I see nothing. <laughs> so I'm on uh, PowerPoint. So I went into PowerPoint. Uh, do I have to do something like share my screen or? Yeah, so there's a share button. It's a green button there at the bottom. Uh, and then in, in sharing, if you can't it. find it, I've got it. Because I had you share your, your presentation with me. OK, let me go back to the meeting here. Uh, share screen. Okay. So, there we go. Okay, so let me set up the slideshow. So, Perfect. Are we there? That's it. Oh, ready to go. All right, so th this is an introductory um, presentation on offshore PPLI. So if in the first quarter of it, you don't uh, hear the word PPLI, uh, don't don't tune away. Uh, you're still on the same uh, on channel here, but I, I want to put it in the proper context. So that, that's the reason for a little bit of a slow start, so to speak. So here we are at the, uh, is the top cut off on yours or what, uh, do, you, do you see the whole thing? I see the whole thing, yeah, we're okay. good. Okay, mine's a little cut off, but I'm familiar with them. So we begin here at the uh, meeting of the Indian and Atlantic Oceans. 
and we see this mysterious white line. So that's what interests us here at Cape Point, South Africa. And for us, it's symbolic of all the financial disciplines that come together to create an EWP asset structure. So we're going to call it the unifying force. So if it's a unifying force, what does it unify? It unifies these disciplines, which are usually taken separately. Uh, financial planning, entity structuring, asset management, estate planning, asset protection, and last but not least, life insurance. So two questions we can ask each other on our journey is how can we benefit each other and how do we materialize this benefit? So if we're going to bother to journey together, why not make it a happy journey? We could be strolling underneath these magnificent magenta leaves, or how about a trip to this fairy tale like castle in Bavaria, Germany? Oop! This is not a good start. Let's begin again. So at the end of our journey, we're going to have some case studies, which we call simple solutions for complex issues. So we saw what a happy journey might be like, but what about an unhappy journey? This guy looks like he's going nowhere, a stairway to nowhere. And this stairway doubles back upon itself. So again, you're going nowhere. How about falling endlessly into the murky ocean? Or would you want to be perched upon this precarious rock? So what do these images signify? Well, confusion, overcomplication, and uncertainty. It's a bit like the eerie feeling you get when you see this spider in its web. But for the moment, let's concentrate not on the spider, but on the web. Well, I first gave this presentation in uh, Shanghai, China. And while I was there, I called on some advisors and they showed me this diagram, which purported to be a way for non-US persons to invest in US real estate. And I found, I found that it evoked the same feeling as the spider web. Confusion, overcomplication, and uncertainty. And we call this a spider web structure. And in our talk, we're going to learn to say no to spider web structures. Well, if our clients don't want spider web structures, what do they want? Here are a few things. Privacy, a tax shield, asset protection, succession planning, compliance simplifier, and a trust substitute. Well, these are the very things that are mentioned under expanded worldwide planning on Wikipedia's page on international tax planning. And by the end of our journey, we're going to learn to say yes to an EWP asset structure. So what's the vehicle that allows us to achieve a successful EWP asset structure? Well, I'm going to give you a few hints. What do you think this museum needs in this moment? And what might this kind of insurance might this photographer wish he had? Well, I think you all guessed it. Life insurance but not just any kind of life insurance, private placement life insurance. So we've arrived at our topic. So interestingly enough, PPLI provides the same tax advantages as commercial or retail life insurance. So what are these? 
here I'm, everybody knows this, but it's worth going over. Tax-free or tax-deferred growth on the internal cash value, no capital gains taxes, no income taxes, tax-free death benefit in most jurisdictions, and the ability to pull out the cash value through tax-free loans. So what's different about PPLI? Well, it's most useful for high net worth clients with diverse investment strategies. So in a properly constructed PPLI asset structure, you can invest in real estate, physical assets, hedge funds, and other alternative assets, private equity, intellectual property, art, even yachts and private jets. And how is this so? Because PPLI can focuses not on the death benefit, but on the investment component. It provides a flexible solution that if done correctly, is totally compliant with tax authorities worldwide. So here we have a basic structure, not unlike uh, an ordinary life insurance policy. You have a policy holder, the owner, an insured life or lives, a beneficiary or beneficiaries. What's different are the assets, which are usually held <clears throat> by a custodian, which is most often a bank. So what's the origins of PPLI? Well, it began in the 70s earlier in the US. It was first started by executives at Fortune 500 companies who wanted a different kind of pension plan than what was offered to the general populace of the company. In the early 90s, it was adopted by wealthy individuals and by the mid 90s, major insurance companies came into the marketplace. So here we have Wikipedia's page on private placement life insurance. And in the section on expanded worldwide planning, we're proud to be mentioned as a proponent of EWP. So let's go over a few of the benefits. Tax deferral, we're going to look at a chart in the next slide. The assumptions on the chart are a growth rate of 6.5% annually and a combined tax rate of 49%. So we're talking about clients generally in places like California and New York. So here we have the PPLI structure in brown, the taxable event, taxable investment in blue. So even after 10 years, you have 3.4 million more in the PPLI structure, 8.7 in year 20, and almost 50 million more in year 40. Asset protection. PPLI provides another layer of asset protection that's not available with a trust alone. How is this so? Well, in a PPLI policy, the insurance company becomes the beneficial owner of the assets in the policy. The insurance company is also listed as the beneficial owner on the bank account associated with the policy. And all transactions are done in the name of the insurance company. In the unlikely event of the bankruptcy of an insurance company, a client's protected because the policy assets are separate from the general account of the insurance company. So they're no longer subject to the creditors of the insurance company. Reporting. This is more for international clients 
but we'll go over it briefly. Reporting is becoming more complex globally, but life insurance reporting is much less onerous than trust and other investment uh, type of reporting internationally. These kind of structures can help with pre-immigration planning, what are called CFCs, controlled foreign corporations, if they are some of the assets inside the policy, and with FATCAN CRS, the Foreign Account Tax Compliance Act and the Common Reporting Standard. What's reported in terms of reporting is one number. The total cash value that's held by the policy, not any of the assets held or the underlying investments. Trust planning. Trust are good. You get estate tax exclusion. It helps with generational planning, asset preservation, but does nothing to solve income tax and capital gains tax problem. Let's do a little comparison. On the insurance side, it's contractually based and used by millions. You get tax deferral. Insurance company becomes the beneficial owner. Simplified or limited reporting. You receive a tax-free asset transfer of investments inside the policy and no capital gains taxes. On the trust side, it provides some asset protection, but it's sometimes seen as a tool for the rich. You have more stringent reporting requirements and there's tax filings for the trust and in some jurisdictions for the beneficiaries. And in and of itself, no tax deferral. So all that being said, most of our policies are owned by trust. So you get the best of two worlds when you combine these benefits. Well, how are you feeling up to this point? Hopefully not like this guy. Well, maybe a little like this guy. So now we're gonna go briefly over our case studies. So hopefully you will you won't be scratching your head at the end. So we're gonna call the, our case studies one simple solution. We begin with a New Zealand parent. She had three operating businesses based in the Caymans, 19 million in cash. We formed a holding company to operate the businesses. She had a son living in Florida that she wanted to pass things on to when she passed away. And the son wanted to invest in real estate with the profits from the operating businesses. And the real estate investments were going to be funded by loans from the holding company. So we go back to our basic structure. We have the New Zealand parent as the policy holder with her as the insured life, the beneficiary being the son in Florida and the life insurance policy at the center and the assets, which I just mentioned. We move to the Wu family. They reside in New Jersey, husband and wife with three children. Mr. Wu is a citizen of the PRC, and Mrs. Wu has a green card. They had multiple real estate holdings throughout the US. They had portfolio investments, stocks, bonds, both here and in China. Total net worth, 75 million. They came to us to simplify a proposed structure, which looked a bit like the spider web structure we saw earlier. So again, same basic design, 
different assets. Now we have something slightly more complex, a global ultra high net worth entrepreneur. He had companies in the UK, Europe, US and Africa. He had holdings in natural resources, sports franchises, media management, residencies throughout the world, UK, US and Mauritius. Again, he wanted to simplify his existing structures and reporting obligations and pass things down to his wife and family through his Delaware Trust, which was the owner of the policy. Again, same basic design, different assets. Now we move closer to home, San Jose family, third generation California residents, they owned and managed apartment houses valued at over $100 million. Again, they want to simplify their present structure and to pass things down to the next generation without a state tax. Again, same story, same basic structure, different assets. And we conclude with some real estate developers. They invested in US real estate, about $4 billion currently invested in US real estate projects. Their goal was to optimize privacy, tax efficiency, and asset protection for their US and worldwide clients. Again, a little more complex, but same structure. So I think at this point, you can you've all learned to say no to spider web structures and yes to EWP asset structures. We conclude with this slide to show our diverse client base. The man is purported to be the tallest man in the world standing next to the Great Pyramid in Giza, Egypt, and the woman reported to be the smallest woman in the world. So this ends our journey and thank you. So perfect. your questions. All right, so we got one question here in the chat. Jimmy Ray asked this, he says, so is the life insurance company, he left that word out, is the life insurance company buying the assets? Not sure I understand with the structure illustration. Um. No, they become the 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 beneficial owner. There, there, there's not a, a a a sale per se. Okay, excellent. Now, let's talk because I got a few questions I prepared in advance that I'm thinking of because most of this is going to be brand new to everybody coming on board. So, if anybody's ever heard of domestic private placement life insurance. And comparing that to offshore private placement, what, what would you say are the differences? I've got an idea based on one PowerPoint I downloaded from, and I can mention this company because they're here in the United States. It's from Prudential. They have a private placement life insurance policy. It's nothing like what you talked about. So um, if you share, what's the difference between domestic and offshore? Well, uh, the main difference is the... Offshore companies will accept in-kind premiums. And in the U.S., I think maybe in South Dakota, they've recently changed their legislation such that you, you, you can do a limited amount of in-kind premium transfers. But the for the most part, the policies that are issued domestically in the U.S., are not too different from a retail VUL. And in a retail VUL, you get menus of mutual funds, mostly mm -hmm. different categories. So there it, you, you get a slightly broader menu, but for the most part, it's not too different um, than, than a, a kind of a off the shelf uh, uh, retail VUL. 
Right. That was what I noticed. It's more of um, an institutionally priced uh, chassis, but it's not that much different. Um, that's what I what I noticed as well. Um, the licensing requirements and ENO requirements for working with offshore is very different from working with domestic. Um, let's talk a little bit about that. Well, for the uh, the offshore, the, each company has their individual requirements. Some uh, require you know, others don't. Some uh, have different licensing requirements. But you, you, uh, the main difference is you don't have to have a, a Series Six sixty five uh, registration like you do in the um, in the U.S. because perfect. You, it I mean, most for the most part, these companies are um, based in Barbados and Bermuda, uh, mm -hmm. the most active companies now. So they, uh, in the early '90s, when kind of PPLI was just getting started, they've uh, structured their laws to be, well, let's say PPLI friendly and there's no um, securities requirements. I mean, they don't deal with them like like securities like the U.S. regulators do. Right, exactly. Um, so Robert Dillard asks, do all PPLI use VUL or whole life IUL? Um, I know the answer, but please go ahead. Uh, it, it's, it's basically a variable universal life uh, policy. And and that's the when you read the variable contract sections of the kind of Barbados and Bermuda legislation, uh, that's how they refer to these policies as variable universal life policies. Right, and and if we think about it, if we're putting in businesses into the policy, we're putting in collectibles, we're putting in other things that would that may otherwise be a security into the policy. By definition, they're automatically a variable policy, but that doesn't mean that they're the same as what's uh, available on the retail side. These are very different uh, in terms of, for example, the net amount at risk and the cost of insurance uh, in, in the policy. Because one of the things that is on the retail side is that we're very concerned about that increasing cost of insurance on universal life policies, yet this is structured so differently that that's really not the concern here with the policy. Yeah, for the most part, uh, uh, no. I mean, uh, usually you're, in, unless somebody had a particular need, you're structuring the policy so it has the lowest death benefit possible. Exactly. Um, let's see. Rich Coffin asks, is there a minimum net worth of a client? Well, in general, it's it's usually clients who are in the, at the minimum 10 to 20 million range. Uh, and the company's minimums are usually around 5 million. But it, it usually my advice to clients is, I mean, just basically financial planning advice, don't put all your eggs in one basket. So you wouldn't want to put all your net worth into a structure. Or, I mean, I, I wouldn't recommend that. Okay just for general risk management reasons. Sure. Uh, Richard Jimenez asks, is there a minimum annual premium? And of course, we're thinking about a traditional policy that normally has structured payments for seven to 10 years plus. Um, this isn't necessarily a minimum annual premium. Uh, how would you uh, answer that one for us? Well, there... In a general sense, there's two basic structures. There's a structure for someone who uh, the main goal is estate planning. So this is somebody in their 60s, 70s, and beyond. And, and that's one structure. And then another is more for uh, retirement planning. So building up uh, just like you would do in a retail VUL, but the numbers are bigger. So in that, uh, in the latter design, uh, you have to have 
in, in, in the estate planning design, usually it's a very low death benefit. But in the retirement planning design, you have to have enough death benefit to accommodate the, the you know, the, the, the corridor rules. You, you have to have enough. Um, so sometimes you run into, if a client wants to put in those situations, a significant amount in, you have to put it in over time. So that's, okay. and that, that kind of softens the amount of death benefit that you need to accommodate the larger um, cash value. Uh, okay. I wasn't familiar with that one. So good. Glad, glad we asked that one. I want to talk a little bit real quick. Are there age limits and what is the underwriting like? Uh, I would say in general, the underwriting is not, not too different. And usually it's somewhere around 85 for the age limit. Um, but uh, there's more flexibility in terms of uh, the insured life or lives. Uh, there's still insurable interest rules, but companies allow, basically it's usually other family members who have an insurable interest in the contract uh, to be named as insureds. So if you had say, uh, say a, a 90 year old who was uninsurable, and you you wanted the contract to last uh, for multiple generations, you could pick a, pick a very young family member to be the insured life. Um, so, and many times there's multiple lives. Perfect. And that, and that keeps the contract in force in perpetuity as long as there is an insurable life on the contract. Um, that's my understanding. Yes. And the lives can be substituted over time. So there's, I would say, more flexibility than there is in the U.S. context. Perfect. And here's a, here's a fun question here that I wanted to ask. What is the compensation like? Because this is has very different compensation than traditional life insurance policies do. It, it's more like an asset management manager is paid. So uh, typically, and these percentages go down as the cash values go up, but generally okay. it's a 1% setup fee and a 1% annual M&A fee. And generally you split that with the company. But um, if, if, if the, they kind of structure that, going down say when it reaches 10 20 million it might ratchet down to 75 basis points you know above 40 uh, 50 basis points and 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 so on Perfect. so there's break points in there the higher the policy growth is that amount above those limits has a lower fee so combined it will be it will be co compositely less than 1% when you factor all of the assets in um, right, right. So, uh, you know, you're not getting, uh, you know, 100% first year annualized commission, but over time, the, the compensation can be quite good uh, as as cases build up for you. So as we think about it, if we think about a $50 million pol policy, well, you know, once everything's funded in there, 1% still split with the insurance company. That's that's a pretty healthy um, amount to receive. That's very much in line with you know, the assets under management model. Though technically, it's not assets under management. It's um, I, I understand right. It's assets under administration. Just right. to keep the the terms separate from Series sixty five uh, types of of activities there. Um, so I want to get back to the questions here. I want to make sure I covered the things on on my mind. Uh, Richard Jimenez asked, "Are funds in the policy accessed using loans?" Yes, yes, it, it's it's very similar to, you know, a U.S. based policy. You, you can take out your basis, you know, what the premium contributions, uh, and then above that, there's a, a a standard. Usually, it's a 
you know, but, but most companies it's somewhere around 25 basis points, you know, for the loan. And then again, if the, you know, there's a dollar left of cash value when you pass away, you know, there's no payback on the loan. Yeah, exactly. So everybody, I want to pay attention to that. That was a 0.25% interest rate on, on the loans. That's, you know, this is institutionally priced types of policies that could be far better, depending on your client, could be far better than the retail, IUL, VUL, whole life and such, which has their own interest rate structures depending on uh, how they're set up. Uh, Juan asks, if, if it is not based in the United States, what is the compliance within our law? Uh, well, it, it, it's pretty much the same um, companies for the most part follow the same uh, regs you know the 7702 regs that a, a US carrier has to has to follow i mean there's the flexibility of of different asset classes but for the rest of the design it's not uh, dissimilar Perfect. So there still has and, to be that the, the the you know the the corridor rules. Uh, the one exception to that is the frozen cash value policies, which are not. Uh, I mean, interestingly enough, I mean before the the, the legislation in 1984, the Tefra Defra uh, rules, uh, you, you could have a policy. Uh, with a very low death benefit and a very high uh, cash value. But then they developed these corridor rules. And then, as we know, in the last few years, they've uh, relaxed those. So you can actually put more in than you could, you know, say five years ago, more cash value per uh, death benefit. Perfect. Um, Kevin McCartney asks, I may have missed this. Is the life company domiciled in, say, the Caymans? Um, and we're not going to talk about specific companies, but I know that there's plenty around the world. Um, yeah, uh, uh, yes, I think so. I, 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 I'm not sure. I, I haven't uh, come across one recently, but I, I think there's some. Um, the, the ones I deal with are mainly in uh, Barbados and Bermuda. Okay. Uh, Brian Kibbledis asks, are there any concerns with Fed's proposed changes to estate planning rules in 2025? Does PPLI have any hurdles here? Well, the, these, these proposed legislation, the, the track record of going from proposed legislation to legislation is uh, uh, very poor. And uh, so that kind of... Uh, dovetails us into the uh, widens committee and the and the green book so uh, you know i pay a little attention to that but the, the like i said the track record has been so poor uh, you know that and it's so politicized that uh, you know it does, it all depends on you know who's in power but the the main one of the things that interests me is the, the 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 people who who wrote the Wyden's report, probably staffers, you know, developed this cute phrase "buy, borrow, and die," but <laughs> you know, so you know, they said it was so outrageous that these very wealthy people could buy a policy, you know, have the take all the money out, you know, tax free, and then die with very little, you know, cash value in there. But even a what we might term as a, a lower middle class person in the U.S. could have a just a simple um, UL policy uh, designed for retirement, and they can they can buy, borrow, and die too. I mean, it it was a little shocking to me that the you know the the buy, borrow, die of course is you know there is kind of to rev people up against the ultra wealthy in, in a political sense, but that anybody that, that they didn't know 
they knew so little about uh, cash value life insurance that you know it's it's basic to every cash value life insurance policy you know that's sold um so it, it, that was a little sad you know that uh, uh, obviously it was you know the poor people who had to write these reports probably just you know were under time pressure and had to produce <laughs> something uh quickly and maybe they knew nothing about life insurance so you know in that sense my heart goes out to them but it, it's kind <laughs> of sad that you know that the, the the people kind of at the top of our uh, government who are you know proposing legislation really know so little about how life insurance works yeah um and in a way i kind of want to keep them that way uh but <laughs> the same because I, I don't want to give them any ideas uh, <laughs> you never know which is another reason to support your nafa organizations finseca all the associations that advocate on behalf of keeping and preserving our life insurance benefits regardless of which format it is because once they attack one eventually it will probably have to literally trickle down to everything else and if we want to pre preserve those benefits we got to make sure that uh, we're advocating for the people that advocate for us and for our clients uh jb ray you've got some more here so you say would you mind breaking down the process a bit more these are the case study with the family in california with 100 million worth of real estate and say they came to us today how would we go about using a ppli to help these people and he goes on, how do we get set up to offer people? Okay, that's the second one. So let's talk about the case study, 100 million of real estate. How? What would that look like? Well, in the in the policy structure, you you would probably form a, a like a holding company or a, another structure, you know, inside the structure, so to speak, that that would. Uh, it could own own the real estate, um, and it, it, that would kind of how you did that would kind of partially depend upon their estate planning goals. So it's a little too complicated to to go into here. Um, okay, perfect. And he goes on to ask, how do we get set up to offer PPLI solutions? Where would you suggest we look for training and guidance on this? Well, it's right there on the screen, my friend. Uh, that's part of it. Uh, get the books I haven't read yet. And um, <laughs> I would say you, you contact Michael Malloy. Uh, there's his phone number. Uh, we haven't put his email in there, but um, or reach out to me and I'll, you know, I'll help make sure that, you know, we all can get connected here and we can figure out if you've got uh, someone worth um, working with uh, on this. What I recently heard lately was that most PPLI uh, solutions are usually offered through family offices. Very few insurance agents really know about this. And so it's usually the family office type of wealth managers that really are offering this and, and make it a talking point. Um, would you say that that's true? Yes. I mean, it's very, um, each case is very case specific. Um, like right now I'm I'm dealing with a few uh, young you know crypto clients and uh, ah. so there there's uh, you know part of the challenge in each case is building the right team so usually I have to go out and find you know the right attorney and the right company who understands the assets the the companies have a certain comfortable comfort level with certain structures and certain asset makes and like some are good with real estate some are good with crypto um i mean they all take you know the stocks bonds those type of assets but on the other they they have to have a a certain familiarity so part of it's knowing the landscape of what company will will take what mm -hmm. no absolutely and they've got to know how to value whatever that tangible asset is how do you evaluate it and what and i'm sure it's got to be evaluated for the beneficiary let alone the insurance company and you know all the different parties that are involved that's just 
me pontificating off the top of my head, I don't know enough on that, but I can only guess that there's multiple variations of how to how to value these things to make sure everybody's treated appropriately for the for the proper valuation. Um, right, right. Yeah, they usually use third party uh, uh, appraisers or, or or third parties to um, value the assets. I mean, it doesn't always have to be a full blown appraisal, but it has to be some independent um, valuation. Okay. Uh, Richard Jimenez asks, uh, if the client is uninsurable, is there such a thing as a private placement annuity? Um, I already know the answer is yes. I have one small booklet that I've picked up uh, on that topic. I haven't read it yet either. Um, but even then, there's usually somebody that you can put onto the policy that has an insurable interest. So that would be my initial thought. Uh, what are your thoughts? I, have, have you done private placement annuities? I, yes, I, I yes. barely know how to say that. <laughs> yeah, they they work sometimes very well for short term cases, like if you had, um, say, a, a business executive moving to the U.S. for say five years or something, and they 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 want to be. Uh, they're going to be employed here, but they don't really want to be part of the um, U.S. tax system. So uh, you can set up an annuity that's going to basically act as a tax shield. And uh, so they're, yeah, they're simpler to uh, issue. There's, you know, lower costs because there's no cost of insurance. But uh, yes, in, in some situations they can, uh, work nicely, but they're, they're subject to the same annuity rules. You know, the um, uh, you have to take uh, uh, you 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 don't get uh, tax free withdrawals, uh, right? Yeah, uh, last in, first out, and and uh, you know other things, and probably the age fifty nine and a half rules and such yeah, other ten percent penalties. All that, yes. There we go. Okay. Um, let's, if we can't, Michael, could you stop sharing your screen? That I just want to open up my screen so I can see everybody too. Um, and then uh, Brian asks, it seems like having a holding company would encourage being able to utilize tax loss harvesting for various types of investment accounts under the same umbrella and get some deductions at federal and state or state level for taxes paid. Um, it's kind of a tax question, but I, I don't think, um, you can do the tax loss harvesting in the traditional sense inside a life insurance policy. That's my understanding. Okay. And that makes sense because there's no capital gains, therefore no capital dedu loss deductions available in an, an insurance com contract of any kind. Um, it's all ordinary income. So, yeah, I'm not I'm not sure about that. So uh, Nathaniel Shapiro asks, does the death benefit reduce every year? And I suppose we're talking about the PPLI structure again. Um, well, I think we, maybe we're talking about the net amount at risk, though. Well, the um, it depends on the policy design and on these two basic designs that I put forth earlier: the retirement design and the estate planning design. The on one, uh, the, the, and on both, there's a certain relationship between the cash value and the and the life insurance. So, on the retirement one, there always has to be a uh, the corridor rules apply and then on the estate planning design uh, as the uh, assets grow the, the death benefit grows but it's a you know a smaller uh, part of the policy than on the retirement design to, to keep it simple uh juan uh, says it seems like we're going to need a class on how to structure this product um Maybe, maybe not. I, my suggestion would be if you've got a prospect that's of higher net worth, that's looking for estate planning and retirement planning, I would say you call Mike, call Mr. Malloy, and we figure that out. <laughs> so, um, and, and actually, you let the insurance companies figure that out. 
Um, that's my understanding, because uh, if I understand right, uh, when you've got a real good pro uh, prospect for this, you'll set up a meeting with the company and the company sends their representatives out and they review all their contract, however, whatever they do, but they do that part. Is Am, am I correct on that? Well, it depends on the on the company and the client and the 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 size of the policy but yes uh -huh. they're 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 very much part of the team perfect and that of course keeps us all in compliance when the company starts doing things that means that's on them not me uh and i always love being able to share any possible liability or or deflect liabilities when we're giving advice because then if it's on the company we can document that very easily. And I, I like shifting that where possible. Um, Robert says, you mentioned that the transfer of insureds are available also. Seems like a second to die could be issued. Is that right? Uh, I think that's kind of built into the contract uh, as to how it could be uh, structured. Yeah, yes, yeah, yes. The And that, uh, it, it, and just like, a, you know, a U.S. base second to die, it, you know, it, it lowers the death benefit somewhat, um, you know, so, uh, yes. Yeah, perfect. Uh, Nathaniel asks, uh, death benefit paid to the beneficiary? And yeah. I, I think if I'm understanding it well, I think what we really want is to keep the policy in force almost indefinitely by keeping adding on new insureds that are managing the policy and the assets within it um, as opposed to actually wanting the actual death benefit to be paid out. It's more like something we want to really keep in force on an ongoing basis by bringing on new insureds and others may be removed, what, whatever that, that process is. Is, is that our, our real ultimate goal? Um, or do we really want that death benefit paid out? And, uh, and then of course we stop getting our ongoing annual assets under administration fees. <laughs> well, yeah, it, it, comes down to the you know what's desired for the policy so if it's like for this retirement planning that i talked about uh more than likely the the use of the structures for when the insured is living but for kind of a estate planning and uh the family planning what you outlined is is kind of ideal because then they, they have a a basic structure for their wealth, which they can keep going uh, over multiple generations. Yeah, that that's amazing to me because you just keep it going almost indefinitely as long as there's someone that could still be added to the policy, meeting the, um, the underwriting requirements, uh, et cetera. Um, at this point, yeah, we don't have any more questions, but these were great questions, guys. Uh, oh, all right, Brian, got one more. Would an existing PPLI client be wise in starting a new company inside the plan or get it started up first and then shifting into PPLI at a later date? Wondering how banks look at extending credit to such situations. Hmm. I'm not quite sure I understand. Are we talking like about a 1035 exchange or? Um, I'm not going to pretend to understand, but um, but as far as let's say someone has, let's say they have their $50 million PPLI policy, they have it set up and it's funded with whatever it is, and they're looking to start up a new company, should they start it up within the existing PPLI contract or set it up separately and then uh, 1035 it? I, I guess that would be the way to do it, 1035 it into the PPLI policy. David, can you hear me? I got you. Hey, Brian. Hey, good morning. Thanks for putting this on, man. I love your shows. It's 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 awesome. Um, thank you. It gets me out of watching um, The View and Oprah. So thank you. Um, OK, oh, God. so like, <laughs> you know how, uh, you know, if someone has like a asset protection trust or beat it, uh, some attorneys will advise, you know, you start your company when it's low valuation or no valuation inside the, the trust. So it's immediately out of your state, especially if it's going to pop. So kind of along the same lines, uh, brand new company starting it from scratch. Uh, has anyone done that? Have they started it inside the PPLI structure or just kind of wait for it to get moving before making that? that? And I don't know if it would be an exchange per se or a note sale. I don't, I don't know how that manifests. Yeah, it, you know, 
these things are kind of company uh, specific. What, like I said, an insurance company's uh, capable of. But yes, I mean that, that that's a, a very valid use of the PPLI structure. Uh, actually, I'm working on a case now with the with crypto, which is some somewhat similar. Uh, mm -hmm. some, someone who has uh, 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 well, a very um, low basis uh, in, in in the crypto, I would think, and, and a lot of appreciation within it, uh, you know, as it's grown uh, yeah, in value. Well, uh, these are founders, like founders tokens. So they're, oh. they're kind of worthless now, but there's going to be <laughs> a, a liquidity event at some point, and they'll be uh, greatly increased in value if, if if certain things come to pass. So, um, yeah, it's an, because you're in basically this tax shield, it's a, a, a ideal place for, 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 for something that's, that's going to blossom into the future. Very cool. Excellent. That's uh, Richard question. said, okay, Kelly, what's up? Well, no, I just, I'll go and turn. I just, I just, I had a okay. question, but I just, let me get one more here. Uh, Richard asked, uh, and I guess his suggestion might be, you can borrow at the point to, you know, 25 basis points to start the new company, then shift the new company's assets into the PPLI. I mean, there's a way to, to raise capital as opposed to looking for uh, other bank borrowing, especially if you have, you know, a well-funded policy, you can borrow very preferred rates. Um, I don't know. That sounds like a no-brainer to me. Um, yeah, again, it's it's kind of company specific about what they'll allow, but uh, it sounds like it could work. Yeah. Okay, excellent. All right, go ahead, Kelly. Yeah, one of the advantages that I think I perceived from uh, other discussions is the perpetuity possibility of the policy. In other words, just staying and letting the family assets grow and grow and grow inside the contract. Um, but it seems like you've got to put, you got to time it correctly to get a new beneficiary or new insured in there before the old insured dies. Um, how is that handled? Because well, you know, if, if, if you wait too long, get, number one's dead and you can't do it, number two. Right. Well, in those situations, generally you, 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 you have several insured names named uh, in, in there. So if somebody, you know, passed away in a car crash or something similar you know you would still be able to keep the policy going okay all right perfect well any final questions comments thoughts um because we are right at the top of the hour this was really really good i think we got into some uh, fairly good detail here as well um, obviously the whole idea of this is not, can you guys do it yourself? Cause well, quite frankly, you don't even know who the companies are. Uh, the idea is if you think you have somebody, let me or let Mr. Malloy know, um, and probably just through me and I'll, I'll connect you together and everything. And let's see if it, if it can make sense. And then from there, you know, uh, Mr. Malloy, he's got his fact finders. He's got his process, the things to figure out, can it be done? And if so, what will it look like? That's the most important thing. And so you don't have to be an expert on this stuff. This is something that I've learned from other people. The idea is, do you have enough talking points to talk a little intelligently, but at the same time say, I don't know all the answers, but I know who does. And then at that point, let's find out. And it's okay. You know, clients like it that you say, look, I got an idea that might benefit you. It's worth, it's worth finding out. And then you bring in the expert, you let them figure it out. So you don't have to worry about trying to know it all, try to structure it all. That's not our job. Our job is to figure out, do we have someone that this could fit for and, and go from there? Um, yes. And our, real quick, yeah. our, our, I mean, our rule on our company is, I mean, everyone involved in a case should get paid. So I'm happy to split uh, fees with you. Perfect. Absolutely. And um, Jason asked a, a final one here. This is a good question. Do multiple insureds raise the cost of insurance per additional life uh, being covered? Um, no. In fact, they lower it a little bit. 
Yeah, because you're gonna you're gonna blend the mortality rates uh, in, in there, especially you know depending on ages that are being uh, brought in. So, um, anyway, basically, you're looking for a higher net worth individual. Robert, uh, Robert says uh, top five use cases: someone who has a high net worth, and as you said, you know, ten to twenty million plus. Um, I would think anybody that has international business, international real estate, especially. Um, those are the things that are coming to my mind that where it's worth the conversation to then find out that could it make sense or not. Um, other thoughts, uh, Mr. Malloy, uh, who, who makes a good prospect on this uh, other than people who also really hate taxes. Uh, that's always good, but, the, but you, but with these policies, they've got to hit, hit the minimum net available net worth that can be transferred in. Yeah. I think you said it well, uh, yeah, on the international side, like, Chinese families, you know, they, they generally have two lives, you know, they have a life in China, and they have a life here. And the PPLI can help with with both, um, both sets of uh, assets. Um, but like you said, anyone who, who qualifies in terms of uh, net worth, and wants a kind of simple, straightforward, compliant structure, you know, with all the benefits that uh, we talked about previously. All right, perfect. That I think wraps it up. Hey, hey, we did good on time. We're at we're at one minute past the hour. Thank you all so much uh, for being here, Mr. Malloy. Thank you for thank your you time and uh, for your time. Thank you so much. And I'm going to be and, uploading uh, this here in a minute. Good. Yeah.